The Fifth Kind. This video is in association with Portal to Ascension. Visit www.ascensionconference.com for information on the upcoming three-day Portal to Ascension Conference in San Diego, California, April 21st to the 23rd, 2023. Paul Wallace is an internationally best-selling author, researcher, and scholar of ancient mythologies. Over the last decade, Paul's work has probed the world's mythologies and ancestral narratives for the insights they hold on our origins as a species and our potential as human beings. As a senior churchman, Paul served as a church doctor, a theological educator, and an archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. Paul's work in church ministry has included training pastors in the interpretation of biblical texts. His work in biblical translation and interpretation has revealed a forgotten layer of ancient story, with far-reaching implications for our understanding of human origins and our place in the cosmos. What are the world's ancestral narratives? We call them myth. Does that mean they're not true. We call them story. Does that mean that they're made up? We call them legends. Does that mean that we're really talking about a very ancient process of Chinese whispers as understandings shift from generation to generation? Well, in my Eden series, Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, Echoes of Eden, I argue that many of our ancestral narratives, the stories carried by indigenous traditions all around the world, are really stories that have been curated to carry visual memory. Our ancestors are telling us what they saw and what they experienced and how they interpreted it. And the stories may be quite colorful in the way they carry that memory in order to be uh, memorable, but that doesn't mean that we dismiss them as fable. It doesn't mean that we have to read them in a fundamentalist way where we think we're reading diary entries and every detail, that's exactly what it was, that's exactly how it played out. But I would say there's a middle territory where we look at these stories and we ask, what is it that our ancestors experienced that they wanted us to know about? And what was the wisdom? they intended to pass on. Now, in my Eden series, I argue that within that embedded memory is the visual memory of paleocontact, that's contact with extraterrestrial visitors in the deep past, that's an awareness of previous civilizations, that's an awareness of planetary cataclysms and civilization resets through the course of our planet's history. I explore all those themes in the books I've already mentioned and the implications for human potential today, because it's one thing to have a different understanding of our origins, but it immediately flows on to understanding who we are in the present, what's possible for you and me in the present, in the light of our ancestors' wisdom. Today, I'm going to peel back another layer. What were our ancestors trying to tell us before their narratives were reframed as fiction? And in particular, what was the Bible about before it became a book about God? Now, in previous talks, I talked about some key words that had been translated as God that possibly shouldn't have been. And those words are Elohim, Yahweh, El Shaddai, El Elyon. And I go into greater detail in those topics in other places. But today I'm going to start somewhere I haven't taken you before, and it's to the land of my ancestors on my father's side, Ghana. And we'll go there in 1948. That's nine years before independence. And we're standing in a public square and we're watching a demonstration. 150 students with placards are campaigning for Ghana's independence. <clears throat> Since the 1820s, Ghana has been governed at gunpoint, in effect, by the British. 
The British have occupied Ghana and they are now maintaining order within the country and establishing all the systems that place it within the empire and all the uh, trading arrangements, banking systems have all been adapted to line up with the British imperial system. Here we are in 1948, 127 years since the beginning of that story, and something is happening. Now, no country is entirely happy to be occupied by another country, whatever the advantages might be. And the advantages were originally to help the governing factions in Ghana maintain order over and against insurgents. And the British said, oh, we can help you with that. But it hasn't been an entirely comfortable arrangement. And when you occupy another country, you have to maintain order by force, effectively. You might be a democracy at home, but you will be gunpoint governance overseas. And the principle is that if you make an example of one person by um, imprisoning them for challenging the king, you want to challenge a thousand. Imprison one, challenge a thousand. Silence one person, a thousand will stay silent. That's sort of the idea. And as long as that's working, you're on a good wicket. But in 1948, the tide has turned. The reason there are 150 students demonstrating and crowds watching besides is that six people have been arrested and now hundreds of people are standing up saying, no, you're not going to do that. The mathematics has reversed. They've arrested six, and now we've got 150 demonstrators and a huge crowd. Now, the six who were arrested were the executives of the United Gold Coast Convention, and that was a group campaigning for democracy for Ghana. They didn't want to be part of uh, the British Empire anymore. And the students from St. Augustine's College and Mfansipim School have stood up in solidarity with those six executives to say, no more of this. We don't accept this. We want an independent, sovereign Ghana. So we watch to see what will happen. Will all the students be arrested? Will they be shot? Well, the authorities had worked out there was a change of fortune here. Arrest six and 150 stand up and crowds turn up to support them. Mm. Better not make any more arrests today in public. Better not shoot anyone. And so they don't. Instead, they wait until tomorrow when the 150 students from those two schools will all be expelled for the impertinence of saying they think Ghana should be a democracy. How dare they? Democracy is for the British in Britain, not for the Ghanaians in the British Empire. Not only do they expel these 150 students, but they fire a number of teaching members of staff of those two schools. There is a law student who decides he's going to do something in response, a man by the name of Kwame Nkrumah, and he puts up his own money to establish a college for all those expelled students to go to, which he calls the Ghana National College, quite an emphatic name. And he found four academic colleagues to form with him the faculty of that new college. And I'm very proud to say that my great uncle, Henry Kofi Sakifio, was one of that group of five that established the Ghana National College, which became the powerhouse for Ghanaian democracy. It would only be nine years later that Ghana would go independent and that Kwame Nkrumah would become the first president of a sovereign, independent Ghana. Story of great pride for Ghanaians and for that whole side of my family. 
it could have played out very, very differently because that was 1948. And what the people in the square on that day could not have known was that they were going to get off very lightly for challenging the empire in this way. Because Kenya, in the years ahead, was going to have a totally different experience. And I'm going to uh, read from a section of the uh, upcoming Eden book just to talk about the kind of pattern of colonization that Kenya experienced. And then you'll see how this relates to the Bible and how we read ancestral narratives and how we understand the Yahweh stories from the Hebrew scriptures. So I talk about how colonization often begins. The offer will be couched in terms like these. We will domicile a major military force in your country. This will be of great benefit to your country's safety in the world and help you manage better any problems you may be having with rebels or insurgents. In return, you will give us your sovereignty. Of course, in due course, the occupied country finds that the occupying army is there to serve the interests of the colonizers above the needs of the colonized. Through imperial systems of monopolies, licenses for access to land, resources and trade, wealth can be redistributed on the basis of loyalty to the new regime. At this point, a farmer no longer has the right to use their own river frontage or rainwater, is no longer allowed to sow their own crops or farm their own land. Through measures like these, along with taxation of property already owned, the traditional economic base of the population can be removed. Reducing the people's wealth, health and security creates a population without a surplus of time and energy. The people become anxious, tired and sick, far more manageable. Disloyalty to the colonizer, now called sedition, will be met with the seizure of a family's property, which can be reassigned to a family loyal to the colonizer. The dispossessed family can be separated, husband from wife, parents from children, to be interred in separate death camps where rebels are hanged and only those willing to show loyalty to the colonizers are fed. Foods and medicines will be supplied as a reward for compliance and loyalty. It will be withheld from everybody else. Those who survive starvation can be put to forced labor. Any leaders of movements disloyal to the colonizers must, must be shown to be tortured and executed in large numbers, parents in front of their children, children in front of their parents. The executions and torture must be public and dramatic in order to send the message to the wider population that it is better to love the colonizer than to resist. Pleas for mercy to the emperor, king, or foreign power must fall on deaf ears and must be seen to fall on deaf ears. These are not hypotheticals or generalizations, if only. Now, I've expressed that in uh, general terms, but uh, that was exactly the experience of Kenya in the years ahead. Now, you might hear that pattern and think, hold on, which, which empire was that? Which, which king or queen did that? Which president did that? And uh, that's a reasonable question, although I've already told you it was Kenya and you know what empire that was part of. It's a reasonable question because those are pretty standard methods of colonization. That's a pattern that's repeated in different countries around the world. I tell that now because it's actually a decent background to what we see in the Bible. You get to 1 Samuel 8, and there is a pivot in the affairs of the people of Israel. The people of Israel, the tribes of Israel, come together and they say they no longer want direct rule from Yahweh. Yahweh's rule has been mediated through a non-accountable spokesperson, the prophet, the oracle, Eli, and his two sons. And they've been managing things in a very unjust and exploitative way. 
But when the people complain, Yahweh couldn't care less about their exploitation. He sees it as an attack on the authority he has established. The people say, we don't want direct rule from Yahweh anymore. We want to be governed by one of our own. And at that point, um, Yahweh decides not to come and speak to the people himself. He doesn't want to stand up in front of that crowd. So he sends his spokesperson to warn them what it will mean if they go ahead and reject his leadership and appoint one of their own to be a human king. And I will just see if I can find that quote. So this is the speech that uh, that the prophet gives. This is what you can expect from a human king. He will separate your families, taking your sons from you and forcing them to fight in his armies. He will force your sons into labor on his own farms and set them to work in his armaments factories. He will take your daughters from you and turn them into his slaves. He will take the best of your crop yielding farms, the best of your olive groves and vineyards, and give them as rewards to his deputies and those who loyally serve him. Is this sounding at all familiar? He will tax the fruit of your labors, your wine and grain, and will supply the revenue to his officers and servants. He will take your young men your male and female servants, and your donkeys, and put them to work on his own properties. He will tax your livestock and reduce you to a life of servitude. On that day, you will cry out to Yahweh for mercy, and he will not hear you. Well, you don't need a PhD to realize it's the same thing. It's the same thing that Yahweh is describing. These modalities of colonization and dominance are ages old, older than the British Empire, the Dutch, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Roman, the Mongol Empire. These have been the methods and modalities of colonization since the year Dot. And Yahweh knows these methods from the inside out. And indeed, as we go through the pages of the Hebrew canon, we find these patterns repeating in his own governance over his people. Now, that pivot, when the people say, we don't want direct rule from Yahweh anymore, we want to be led by one of our own, is a pivot that occurs in a whole canon of stories that span the globe a canon of stories that we could identify as dragon stories. So many cultures have dragon stories. You've got the uh, Colchis from Georgia, the Coca from Spain and Portugal. You've got the Cuchedra and the Acuchu from Japan. You've got Quetzalcoatl, Cucumats, Kukulkan from Mesoamerica. Dragon stories around the world follow a similar pattern. It begins with human colonies governed over by a dragon, and the dragon will dominate them with fear and terror. And anyone who stands up to the dragon is made an example of, by which I mean a very violent execution. And the dragon taxes them. Dragon wants beef, lamb, gold, virgin girls, and everybody finds that they're really living a life of servitude towards the dragon. Everything has changed since the dragon showed up. Well, things carry on like this for generations and generations, and then a pivot arrives. And the pivot takes a couple of forms. Either a prince arises who, for some reason, is just not scared of the dragon and confronts it and kills it. And so uh, St. George would be an example of that kind of story, St. George and the dragon or uh, Daniel in the, uh, in the Bible, uh, in Bell and the Dragon, which is in the, the deuterocanonical books, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. There you've got a hero who stands up, confronts the dragon. And it's such an ancient story, has been going for so long, that by the time we get to the story of Beowulf, which is, what, the 6th century? 
that that originates, the writer of Beowulf is already beginning to change and subvert and adapt the story because the standard story is so well known. But the other version of the story is the version we find in uh, the Hebrew canon. And that is where the people have been terrorized by fiery destruction and exploitation for so long that they move from a place of subjection and depression to a place of anger. They are just not prepared to live this way any longer. How dare the dragon subject them to a life like this? There's this emotional switch that turns. And it's as if the dragon has been using the same old terrorizing practices for so long that you can't be frightened of them anymore. And that people have reached the point of saying, well, what, what can he do? He can only kill us. And somehow that's not so terrorizing anymore. And so the people come together and they realize if we confront the dragon with one voice, if we confront the dragon in solidarity, then the dragon can't govern anymore. If it's just one person at a time saying, I don't want to work for you anymore, the dragon can pick us off one by one. But what's it going to do? Kill us all? What's the point of that? Won't have any servants or slaves if it kills us all. And so the people come together. They confront the dragon together. We're not frightened of you anymore. We've had enough. We're not going to work for you anymore. And when the dragon sees that the mathematics has changed, he's killed one and now a thousand have stood up, dragon gives up and often just slinks away to the mountains to live out its existence in lonely solitude. Now, that's really a story of social progress and social development, of people discovering one another, people discovering the power of organization, the power of solidarity, and realizing that when they reject fear, and allow their love and solidarity to confront the despot, the despot can no longer govern. And I'm old enough to have seen the dragon story play out many times in real world history, in our geopolitics. So I think about what happened with the Marcos, the first Marcos regime, I should now say, in the Philippines, where people have been exploited and terrorized for so long that the terror lost its power to paralyze. And the people stood up and the Marcos regime could tell they no longer had purchase over the population. Very similar to what happened in Romania, where Nikolai and Alina Ceausescu were standing in front of the crowd trying to pacify them. And we watched this in real time. We watched their reaction as they realized these people have no respect for us anymore. We have no authority standing in front of this crowd. And well, it was only a matter of hours later that the regime was over and the lives of the Ceausescu's was over. South Africa, uh, an amazing example of people coming together all around the world to say enough is enough with apartheid. And the struggle against apartheid had been um, really symbolized in the South African regime's treatment of Nelson Mandela and a worldwide campaign of people standing up saying, no, you can't treat my brother that way. And we saw things change. I, I can remember his walk to freedom when he was finally released. And it was an incredibly moving experience. At a similar time, this was only months apart, that we saw the uh, soldiers who manned the border between the East and West simply stop taking action because people crossing the border had just reached a proportion where the mathematics no longer worked. It just wasn't worth trying to stop them. And once people realized they'd stopped policing the border, it was only hours later that the Berlin Wall was being sh literally shaken and torn apart and came down. These are incredible moments. Um, I'm so glad they're caught on camera because they are reminders that things can change. Other ways are possible. And things that seemed immovable, the behemoths and dragons of our time, are not immovable when we are willing to find each other, 
reject fear, and to learn how to speak with one voice, learn how to um, speak together and pull together for the common good. It still has the same power that it always did. And that's what our ancestors wanted to tell us when they shared these stories. They didn't tell these stories of um, colonization in the world of paleo contact just to tell us how awful it was, but to show us that other ways are possible. And this is how things changed. But all these lessons in social progress uh, evaporate the moment you translate Yahweh as God and the moment you translate Elohim as God. Once you make that translation, you have to accept whatever the God character does in the pages of the Bible without question. And it frames the idea of what is good and what is bad in a really paralyzing way. What is good is following orders, whether they make sense or not. And well, we've already had a 20th century to show where that kind of thinking leads. When we read through the uh, stories of Yahweh, we find that he uses all the methods and means that his prophet Eli enumerated in that speech. And when um, the kings who come after him start doing things he disapproves of, he takes punitive action. And it seems whether you're a citizen or, or you're a king, uh, you're not allowed to think for yourself. And that's how things play out. Uh, I'll come back to that in a little while. But when we read these stories as God's stories, we are not allowed to evaluate what the Yahweh character is doing, and we lose our moral compass, and we lose our political compass as a consequence, because we just have to accept what comes from God and what comes from the higher ups. There are layers and layers of political education in the Hebrew scriptures and in many other narratives around the world which are clear as day when we read these as stories of colonization by ET visitors, when we read them as stories of paleo contact, read them as God's stories, there's no moral of the story. You just do what you're told. So um, let me go to another political lesson that is hidden in the Bible by these mistranslations. Growing up in Great Britain, I was mystified, really, by how things worked, because I was told that Britain was a democracy. Technically, my educator said, we're a constitutional monarchy, but the powers of the monarchy are really just symbolic. They're really just ceremonial. Uh, in, in working practice, we're a democracy. Well, that certainly should have been the case. I mean, after all, it was uh, 1215, a long, long time ago, that the Magna Carta was signed, when the barons found that if they acted with solidarity, they could curtail the powers of their king, and they could bring in a rule of law and a bill of rights instead of absolute crown power. Huge change in 1215. Then in 1649, they decided to get rid of the king altogether. King Charles I was executed and a bill was passed through Parliament to abolish it, abo abolish the office of king. In 1660, they changed their mind and a new king was appointed, albeit with curtailed powers. And then in 1688, there was something called the Glorious Revolution to curtail the powers of the crown even further so that the country would now be governed by Parliament with many of the crown's powers devolved to Parliament. And then there were huge social shifts. I mean, the 1800s, voting was extended from the nobility, uh, who were all in the same boat, so to speak, to the common man. And it was the common man. Only males were allowed to vote, adult males. And those reforms came in the 1800s. We had to wait till the 1900s before the voting franchise was extended to adult females. But now we've got something that looks like a democracy. And then in the 1900s, we had the labor movement, which produced new uh, generations of leaders whose whole purpose was to contend for public policy that would serve the common good 
instead of the good of the 1%, in effect, shifting from a pattern of $1, one vote to one person, one vote. These huge seismic shifts. And yet, how much was really changed? Again, I'll just read from a paragraph from the upcoming book. People often assume that after all these changes, crown powers really are no more than ceremonial and have no real purchase in 21st century politics, except in my lifetime and in recent years, we've seen these powers used by the crown to amend legislation, to avoid legal scrutiny, to shut down successive police investigations into elite crime, and to depose a democratically elected prime minister on the other side of the world in Australia. These powers are far from ceremonial. They represent a hidden hand in the political operations of what looks on the surface like a democracy. And indeed, after all those changes, the British Prime Minister can't form a government until the king gives him permission. And all through the Prime Minister's tenure, he will have to report to the king every week on what he's doing. No one is allowed to be a member of parliament until they sworn an oath of allegiance to the crown, so on and so forth. And you might think, well, how is this possible after all those revolutionary changes? Jeremy Paxman, who anchored the BBC's Newsnight for 25 years, asks what's potentially an even more probing question. After all those huge social changes, a civil war, a revolution, abolition of uh, the monarchy, so on and so forth, that it's still the same five families running Britain as 500 years ago. How is that possible? Well, the answer is many layered, but I'm going to mention a couple of layers here. Vested objects and covert government. I'll start with vested objects, which I think is a rather fun subject, uh, a rabbit hole I'm enjoying exploring. And it's quite topical because last month, Ian Hamilton died at the ripe old age of 97. He was a QC, which is a, a senior uh, judge, a legal advisor to the Crown. And he was a senior criminal lawyer in Scotland for decades, very well respected. And all the press have talked about his death. The movie's already been made about his life. And you're sitting there thinking, Ian Hamilton, I've never heard of him. Why are they making a movie about some criminal lawyer in Scotland? Why would Robert Carlyle accept that part? That doesn't sound very Oscar worthy. Well, the answer is to do with something that happened in 1950. In 1950, Ian Hamilton was an eager young student of law at Glasgow University. And he found three friends to make a trip down to London. And he rode down to London on his motorcycle, I believe it was. And when they reached Westminster Abbey, they took a crowbar, pried the door open, crept in to the dark building, because it was the middle of the night, and lifted 336 pounds, that's 152 kilos, of sandstone, which they then drove at breakneck speed and with police pursuing all the way back to Scotland. And once safely over the border, they deposited it at Arbroath Abbey. The arrival of the stone in Scotland was greeted with celebrations in the streets. And there was a real atmosphere of festival around this sandstone. Meanwhile, in Westminster, there were fears of revolution and of Scotland leaving the Union. What on earth was all that about? Well, Ian Hamilton later commented on it, and he said this, and I'll do my best Scottish. Independence is now inevitable. The stone transcends politics. 
regardless of our political views, Scots recognise there is something that binds us together. What was it all about? That £336 block of sandstone is what I call a vested object. It's called the Stone of Scone or the Stone of Destiny. And prior to 1296, when it was taken from Scotland and brought down to Westminster, it was the stone used for the coronation of Scottish kings. And since arriving, in England in 1296, it's been used for the coronation of all the English sovereigns from that time to this. And why did they put it in the sanctuary of Arbroath Abbey? Because that's where the Scottish barons came together and signed the Declaration of Scottish Independence back in the 1300s. The stone is a vested object. It represents the right to rule over Scottish lands. That's why the English wanted it, and why the English wanted it back, and why the Scots wanted it back. That's why this very honourable man, who has just passed away as a QC and a senior criminal lawyer, risked his freedom and his entire career to bring that stone back to Scotland. It represents Scottish sovereignty. So that's a vested object, a thing that carries within it authority and power, often because that has been vested upon it, projected upon it. Um, a crown is a vested object. An orb, a scepter, these are vested objects. We'll be seeing these, of course, in the months to come on the TV. The gold in the crown, the diamond from this colony, the opal from this colony, the sapphire from this colony, all embedded in the crown, represent the right to rule over those places. It's quite telling to look at portraits of George Washington. Uh, made during his lifetime and shortly thereafter, and to compare them with the portraits of King George III. King George III, of course, was the king of America uh, before George Washington became the first president. And in the pictures, you will see the same motifs. They look remarkably similar to each other, albeit George looks rather more overweight and less healthy. And George Washington looks a little younger and fitter. But you will find a navy blue coat, a naval hat, golden epaulettes, a staff, a sword, a Roman mace and eagle, which were the symbols of power in the Roman Empire, disguised as a table leg, white powdered wigs, crowns and flags in the background, gold braid, and lots of gold. And all those objects are vested with associations of power and authority. And the fact that they're all in the portraits and they're so similar is really a message that though we now have a president and not a king, the president has all the same kinds of power. It's the same kind of power that has passed from the old regime to the new regime. In the Bible, we find vested objects as well the Ark of the Covenant, uh, containing Aaron's staff, Aaron, the uh, number one officer to Moses, has this staff of office that can do amazing and magical things. And there's a jar of manna that recalls Yahweh's supernatural uh, power to generate food and keep his people alive. There is the uh, Nehushtan, which is the bronze image of the serpent, which um, the people had to kowtow to um, because otherwise they'd die because uh, Yahweh was punishing them for complaining about their emergency rations and being too hungry. And then there's the Urim and the Thummim, which are devices for obtaining um, guidance from a Yahweh who's no longer on the planet's surface. These are vested objects in the Hebrew stories. They represent the right to rule 
over the tribes of Israel, which is why enemy powers tried to steal these objects. And so the story is told of what happened to them when they stole our vested objects and how the totem of their powerful one fell down and broke and how they all got sick when the vested object was in their community and they had to send it away on a cart carried by two oxen so that the tribes of Israel could have their holy objects back. But what's curious about those objects is that they may be the vested objects of a previous civilization. Why do I say that? Because it's quite clear that neither they nor the writers of the Hebrew scriptures knew how these objects worked or what they really were. We have details for constructing an ark, and we're told that it's a communications device, but we're not told how it works. We're told that it can create vortices of wind, but we're not sure how. We're told that if you touch it, you'll get electrocuted and die, or if you go near it, you'll get radiation sickness, but we're not sure why. We're told that the Urim and Thummim can be used for getting some kind of guidance, um, some kind of remote communication going with Yahweh, but we're not told how. And I would suggest that this is because those who came before knew how to operate those things, whether we're talking about a previous human civilization or the ET visitors who instituted the uh, um, practices surrounding these objects. So the objects remain, they still hold their association with power, but no one quite knows how they work anymore. So we have these objects that symbolize the passage of power. So presumably, Yahweh hands over things to his successor when he's deposed, and King Saul has them. Saul now has the power, right? And then when Saul commits suicide, um, his successor David now has the power, right? And the kings have the power. Is that, is that right? Not right. When Saul does something that Yahweh would not have done, and what it was is he waged war more mercifully than Yahweh would have waged it. Uh, he wins the battle. He defeats the military. What Yahweh would have done was to kill every man, woman, child, and animal and leave only scorched earth. And when Yahweh sees that Saul is running things differently, he deposes Saul. And if that weren't bad enough, he infests him with some kind of iconic entity to make him mentally ill and drive him to suicide. And then he's replaced by David who, as we know, was somebody quite happy to use uh, murder um, for his own personal pleasure. A man after my own heart, says Yahweh, until David does something Yahweh doesn't like. Yahweh wants a king who will go to war at the drop of a hat just because Yahweh says, I want you to defeat those infidels down the road. What David does is he counts his troops to make sure that he only embarks on winnable wars. And Yahweh doesn't want his orders questioned like that. It's not, if I can do it, it's yes, sir. And so David is punished. Uh, he is allowed a merciful punishment, which is the slaughter of 70,000 of his own infantry. Yahweh kills them. These aren't rebels. These aren't insurgents. These aren't infidels. These are his own soldiers who he kills just to show what happens when you think for yourself. And then we have Ahaziah, again, one of Yahweh's own kings. He wants um, some medical advice from another powerful one, the powerful of Ekron down the road. And Yahweh is so offended that his own king doesn't think he, Yahweh, is smart enough to do a proper prognosis that he pronounces a death sentence over his own king. And so here we have this message of don't think for yourself. Do what you're told. And that applies whether you're a citizen or a king. And that's become our idea of righteousness and sin through the whole of Christian history. That's what we think righteousness is, doing what we're told 
and sin is doing what God doesn't want. And we've lost all agency to think for ourselves and weigh things up, whether the thing is good or bad. It's that knowledge of good and evil that the senior Elohim in Genesis 6 didn't want humans to have. The senior Elohim in Genesis 3, uh, the story we call the fall, wants humans kept at an animal level, so unintelligent that we don't even know we're naked. This is the Yahweh character in Genesis 3, although that name's been superimposed. He wants humans that can be trained. They will do the right thing because if they do the right thing, reward. If they do the wrong thing, pain. That's how we train animals. And that's what he wanted for us. Whereas the serpent said, no, they need to be conscious. They need to be aware. Uh, this is not a happy existence for them. And so he does the upgrade. That's the Genesis 3 story, which repeats in narratives all around the world. But it's not just about models of goodness, sin, righteousness. This is about covert government, isn't it? Because the people thought they'd got rid of Yahweh and replaced Yahweh with a human king, Saul, one of their own, to pursue policies for the common good, except the body sitting on the throne has changed, the face fronting up to the public has changed, but lurking in the dark in the corridors of power is Yahweh still calling the shots. When it doesn't go his way, there will be consequences. Same with David all the way through to Ahaziah. And so what the Hebrew narrative tells us is that just because the position holder has changed doesn't mean everything has changed. Just because you have a new king doesn't mean the system's changed. Just because you've gone from a monarchy to a democracy doesn't mean the powers behind the throne have all disappeared. Just because you have a new boss doesn't mean that the dynamics at work are going to be any different or the ethics of business will be any different because you'll still be doing business with the same other businesses. And this reflects in our own world, doesn't it? You can have a general election, a change of government, but if those who are providing the financial incentives to the people in power are the same, what's going to change? And we've seen in elections in uh, Australia and certainly in Britain, where major corporate interests have given major financial incentives to both sides, so that whoever wins the election, the policies will run in their favor. Now, all that insight was there in the Bible when you read it through the lens of paleo contact. When you realize that 1 Samuel 8 isn't a rebellion against God, it's a rebellion against colonization by a foreign power, an ET power, these political lessons become very clear. Suddenly you're going to be concerned who's got the vested objects. Suddenly you'll be concerned is covert power still being exercised by the old regime because you can read it in the stories. And you will look out for it in the present when our ancestors have explained the dangers to us. But all these warnings, all these lessons disappear the moment you think Yahweh is God and El Shaddai is God and El Elyon is God and the Elohim means God. All these pieces of information, all this insight, all this wisdom being offered by our ancestors becomes hidden. Was it uh, deliberate? Was it accidental? Maybe a little bit of both. And it relates to the final redaction that produced the Bible as we know it. There's a very broad scholarly consensus that this final edit was done in the 6th century BCE on an ideological agenda to teach monotheism. And so a very disparate a uh, bunch of scriptures and scrolls were gathered together and reworked into a single piece to teach monotheism. And anything in those texts that ran in a different direction had to be obscured in some kind of a way. I'm 
I'm going to give an example of how we know that and what that a burial of information really amounted to. I'm going to take you to Tel Arad uh, in the Levant in the 7th century BCE to a harvest festival. Here we are in this beautiful city of Tel Arad. It's full of music and dancing. Everyone is joyful today. It's celebration. There are tables in the streets with food, and in particular, scones, wheat cakes, uh, that are a celebration of wheat, food, farming, agronomy. And these are carried and these are eaten in procession with incense burning and people holding clay baked dolls or figurines of the Queen of Heaven. And we will go and we will show honor to the standing stones where we first met the Queen of Heaven. And then we'll go into the temple for a ceremony where the high priest will preside over the ceremony. Hold on a minute, you're thinking. What? Sorry, tell Arad, is this Judaism? Because it doesn't sound much like Judaism. Um, Standing stones, queen of heaven, temple at Tel Arad, high priest at Tel Arad. There's only one high priest, isn't there? And he in Jerusalem. There's only one temple, isn't there? And that one in Jerusalem. There's only one giver of the harvest, and that's Yahweh God, isn't it? This doesn't sound like Judaism, except it was. It was Judaism all throughout the country. At that time, Judaism was a practice that involved many temples, many high priests, many gods or powerful ones, including the Queen of Heaven. And the Queen of Heaven was known as Asherah, Astarte, Elat, Hathor. The Romans called her Venus. The Greeks called her Aphrodite. She was the lion lady. In Sumeria, she was Shamhat. In Mesoamerica, she was Hun Hunapu. The Zulu people remember her as Bab Mwana Warisa. And if you look at your little clay figurine, you'll see that she has bouffant hair and is bare breasted. And who she is, is the giver of agriculture, the nurturer of humanity, the one who taught us how to move from animal subsistence to the ability to farm and build cities and become a civilization. She is the mother of civilization. Now, that might not sound like Judaism, but it was in the 7th century BCE. And there are references to this all throughout the canon, but I'm going to read to you from the book of Jeremiah, which says this, and this is describing their worship a century later in the 6th century BCE, sorry, uh, before in the 8th century BCE. Jeremiah says this, the Israelites worshipped, now what do you think he's going to say? The Israelites worshipped Yahweh, didn't they? No, apparently not. The Israelites worshipped other powerful ones. The Israelites spoke disparagingly of their powerful one, Yahweh. What? Wasn't it the other way around? Apparently not. The Israelites spoke disparagingly of their powerful one, Yahweh. They built high places i.e. temples, in every place they lived, not just Tel Arad. From every watchtower to every fortified town, they set up standing stones and asherahs on every high hill and under every green tree. Standing stones we know from the practice of Jacob in the Bible and other cultures around the world are erected to commemorate places of contact, contact with higher beings. And it was the case here. These standing stones say this is where we were when we first met Asherah. This is where Asherah appeared in this town. This is where Asherah appeared in this community. And so here we have a little encapsulation in Jeremiah of the 8th century BCE, where the memory of Yahweh is negative. It's a memory of colonization, as I spoke of before. No wonder they had negative associations. 
and a positive memory of Asherah, who they are honoring on every high hill and under every green tree. So the redactors in the 6th century BCE can't leave it like that because the scriptures are supposed to teach monotheism using the holy name the Jews now used for God, which was Yahweh. So somehow they had to try and make Yahweh look better and Asherah look worse. And how did they do this? They did this by never passing judgment on Yahweh's actions, no matter how brutal they were. And they were brutal because they took the name Yahweh and put them over the stories of other Elohim back in the time before Yahweh had even appeared. So Yahweh actually has to carry the can for a lot of entities who were doing violent colonization. Uh, but they would report that with no moral judgment on what he's doing. Whereas with Asherah, who is mentioned 40 times through the scriptures, they are going to add some kind of a gloss, some kind of a comment to indicate Asherah bad. And I don't know if you're at all familiar with a, an English book called 1066 and all that, but they sort of lampoon this style of history where the writer will say, so-and-so was a very bad king, and what he did was very bad. He was worse even than all his ancestors. And you get exactly that kind of comment when the Bible has to concede that Solomon built a temple to Asherah. Whoops. We better make a little footnote that that wasn't a good thing. That's kind of how it rolls. And so the memory of paleocontact is obscured. And monotheism is endorsed. And this whole layer of memory of paleocontact, the knowledge of who we are, who our cosmic neighbors are, these political lessons in social progress and evolution, all gone, all lost. Never mind about that, because all the people need to know is there's only one God, and it's the Jewish God. And so that's where the redaction took us. So where does our help come from? Well, the stories of paleo contact are many and diverse all around the world, and the same applies with the paleo contact stories in the Hebrew canon. Where did our helper Asherah come from? If you go to Tel al-Farad, which was the capital of the northern kingdom in the 9th century BCE, you can find an engraving of a naus. Now, these can be found throughout the Levant. And what a naus is, is a doorway with no building. It's a doorway. There's nothing behind it, and there's nothing at the side of it. But in the doorway, a being appears. And the being appears in this naus, in Tel al-Farad, the being of Asherah. Now, what do we call a doorway that has nothing behind it, but people can come through it? Don't we call that a portal? If so, does it tell us anything about where Asherah came from? Clearly, she was an advanced being. She lifted humanity, or the being she represents lifted humanity from animal subsistence to civilization builders. So. Where did she come from? There's a little clue on the naus to be found in Tel Al-Farad, the symbol of a crescent moon and the stars of the Pleiades. Now, we might say, oh, that's just a random decoration. If it weren't for the fact that there are many other cultures who identify the Pleiades as the source of the beings who came and taught our ancestors agronomy. Listen to the Cherokee people, they will tell you exactly the same. And they carry a memory of their arrival in objects that look like eggs, which landed, people came out and sat with their elders and taught all the things that Asherah taught in those stories. But this was all to be forgotten. And I'll see if I can find one final quote here.
I can't. So I'll tell you by memory that there was a cleanup in the 7th century BCE of all this liturgical practice. All these harvest festivals honoring Asherah and other beings had to be gotten rid of. And so those clay figurines were smashed, broken, decapitated. The standing stones were knocked down. The other altars were broken. They were going to clean everything up. So there was only one temple left, the temple in Jerusalem. Only one useful high priest had left the one in Jerusalem. So there's a great centralization of power of the religious society of the Jewish world. Everything centered on the one family in Jerusalem, the high priestly family, and the monarchy, as long as the monarchy endured. Instead of many temples, one. Many priesthoods, one. All the power, all the tithes, all the taxes going to the center. And then a century later, the redactors did to the scriptures what Josiah had done to the ritual practice, cleaned it up and tried to get rid of all the memory of the Hasayim. This was the text I was looking for. Getting rid of all the symbols of the Hasayim. And that word means the armies that came from the sky. Well, I think it's a shame that we lost this knowledge. And it means that by the time we get into the New Testament, and by the time we're reading 1 John 4, where the writer clearly expects the early Christians to be experiencing helpful contact with other kinds of being, the knowledge of who and what those other kinds of being are has been lost. He doesn't seem to know. He knows there's contact. He knows there's useful information. But he's not quite sure who or what these spirits are that are communicating. And by spirit, we don't mean a disembodied entity necessarily. We don't necessarily mean a physical entity that communicates remotely. Because in some cultures, a spirit was simply an entity that could show up in your room just like that and disappear just like that. So the experience of contact was still there. But the knowledge of who we were in contact with had been obliterated. But before our ancestral narratives became fiction, the knowledge was there. Before the Bible became a book about God, the knowledge was there about our deep past and our present and our future. The knowledge was there as to where our help comes from if we want to progress to a better human experience. And if we do the work of going to root meaning translation, which is what all my books are really about, we discover that our ancestors wanted to, us to know about our power as individuals, our higher cognitive powers, wanted us to understand our power in solidarity when we work together, our power when we reject fear. Our power when our love for our brothers and sisters exceeds our loyalty to those over and above. This is our power to progress. They wanted us to know the pain of colonization so we could recognize its patterns in the present. They wanted us to know about the dangers of covert government so that we could ward against it. They wanted us to understand there is an invisible ET layer to world politics, just as there was in the time of Saul and David and Ahaziah. They wanted to understand that we can enjoy contact with ET neighbors that is positive and nurturing, both in the deep past and to provide help in the present. All these lessons are available today if we are willing to listen again to stories we may have dismissed as fictions and fables. All these lessons are available to us if we're willing to dig a little deeper in translation and get to the root meanings of key words. Because if we do that, we will find a whole other layer of understanding available to us, which can transform our lives in the present. So I'll pause there and say thank you for listening. And Neil, looking forward to getting into some Q&A.
Paul, oh, brother, I, I, I'm almost speechless, man. You have, that presentation was beyond incredible. Your research is seen. You are so appreciated. What you just did there, it was next level, seriously. And, you know, I've heard a lot of this information, but the way you just broke it down is something I've never heard before and just put so many um, things, like just pieces of the puzzle together. So I just want to first say thank you so much for all that, brother. Incredible. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, it's all in the next book. So I hope I've whet your appetite. Uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. So I, I took some notes and, um, you know, let's just start from here. First, I want to talk about, you know, 7th century BCE you're, you're referring to. Well, in the Yuga cycle calendar, that's the beginning of the Kali Yuga, the 7th century BCE. It was when we fell from the, um, the Silver Age to the Dark Ages. So it was extremely interesting how it goes right on the same time when we shift in ages. But from what you were saying, another thing came up of political, the political connection to the ancient times. That was, it, it was almost like spiritual, spirituality and contact was decentralized. And then it became centralized, which is also a mirror reflection of the centralization of power, right? And now we're kind of going back to the decentralization. So just wanted to see what your thoughts are on that. Oh, yes, I think you've got that absolutely right. I think um, it was part of a, a bigger pattern. And I'm really glad you said it in that context. That's a topic you know more about than I do. But it was exactly about that. We're going into an age of authority and a centralization of power, a disempowering of the grassroots and a forgetting of our all our abilities in contact and in finding wisdom. Mm -hmm. I also got from what you're saying that um, after a little while of being oppressed, basically, like in the beginning, you started out like this after a while of oppression it kind of backfires because you can't oppress people to a certain extent because then they start realizing they're being oppressed and they um they revolted in many different you know many different ancient stories and so to me it's almost like this darkness if it is a sentient awareness and conscious on this level it's almost like they've they should know that eventually there's going to be a retaliation so that goes to the whole understanding that the darkness is truly working for the light, that this is all, it's almost inevitable that through oppression, through um, taking away people's powers, eventually people are going to wake up to the truth and, you know, discover who they really are. So that's something also I got out of what you're sharing. Yes, that's right. I think there's kind of a law of diminishing marginal returns uh, if you're governing by violence. And I think, yes, First of all, you're oppressed and you don't notice. Then you're oppressed and you do notice. And and then after that, you're oppressed and a new generation comes up and says, what's the point of living like this? And are willing to say things like, well, they can only kill us. Mm -hmm. And when you reach that point, of course, the oppressor's got no power left. Right. It's almost like um, it gets to a point where death is almost welcomed on some level because you've been oppressed and tortured so much yeah, not only yourself right. but your loved ones your friends right exactly you're thinking well what's the alternative yeah you know and the, it, that's death, happening it, now yes yes you do see that and you see that time and time again the the 80s was such an interesting period because we saw it on the tv you know, where the crowd suddenly are not frightened of the military or the police. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can still remember it's 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 an ugly moment, uh, the Ceausescu moment, but it, it you just watch that and you there's a certain inspiration in realizing this is a pivot moment in that country's history, and you can feel it in the dynamic of the crowd. They're not frightened anymore, and right. now the leaders are frightened. And they were right to be so. Mm -hmm. So we have a question here from Melanie. And it's probably a, a more of a general question, but let's see where you want to take it. Wh who started it all? So like within the text, you know, within within all of the, how did the cycle begin? Yes, I think that the way we govern and the way we colonize, I think we learned when we were colonized by ET visitors. That's that's my view. And I think um, the memory of that is, is there 
um, in some ways, the memory of it is softened because we regarded them as our superiors and we called them our gods. Uh, but there's enough detail in the stories for us to go back and realize what what that actually was, what we're being told. So I think that when the um, when the ET colonizers went home, I think in some instances they did exactly what we did, which is they set up all the systems and they now just say, well, you can now make a local the governor, you can now make a local the chief of police mm -hmm. and the senior judge, but all the systems are all already there. So I think we learned these patterns from other civilizations. And looking back, and I do a little bit of this in the Scars of Eden, I think we can look back and realize there have been different interventions at different times. And we really have to decide whose cue we want to take up. <laughs> do we want to take up the cue of the, the violent mm -hmm. colonizers or do we want to take up the cue of the nurturers of civilization? Because right. we had that spectrum of experience uh, let's take our pick more thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that might sound ridiculous and like a, a, a theoretical, but if we just apply that to farming, for instance, two different models of farming, one which is uh, destructive and oppressive and poisonous, and another that's empowering and local right. and healthy. Well, we, the people, would make one choice, I think. Those who are accustomed to serving those at the top of the tree would make another because it's 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 profit driven, so on and so forth. So I think you break it down to different areas, and we really can choose which intervention we want to follow in the footsteps of. Whether we're going to follow right. in the the militarizing intervention that leads to petrochemical farming, so on and so forth, or if we follow the Asherah example, which leads to natural organic rotational combination farming where the farmer can seed next mm -hmm. year's harvest with the harvest of this year's i mean it is a choice and those models are clashing right now and uh, people as best they can are trying to make their choices and i think our ancestors have told us enough to equip us for those kinds of decisions right so you're saying that there were um various forms of paleo contact and there were harmonious ones and that the and the Ashara one was a story of harmony. So it's basically what imprint do we want to go with and how we're going to utilize that in order to restructure society, right? Yes, that's right. That's that's so, exactly right. There's an interesting uh um carving that was found. Um I'm trying to remember where it was found, uh, that has Yahweh and Ashura side by side. Wow. And it's almost as if they are the two poles of paleo contact, colonizer, yeah. the nurturer. And I think we do really have that, that freedom to choose. And it's not just we've got this book of theory or this book of theory. Um, we do have company. Mm -hmm. And I believe what the writer said in 1 John 4, that we have co company that's willing to communicate with humanity, not just via government. Right. And so if we're looking to make choices, you know, at a personal level, a family level, a local level, we're not just living in a cone of silence. We we have help and we have the help of our ancestors to prepare us as well. Mm -hmm. So Melanie's saying, but who do you think created the ETs? Well, I am a believer in um, Plato's grand vision of uh, of creation. And uh, it ties in with a modern theory um, called panspermia. Panspermia yeah. is the idea that life in the cosmos is the rule rather than the exception, that we should expect to find it just as much as we should expect to find stars and planets, and that the genetic coding for biological conscious life is actually disseminated throughout the cosmos, that whenever that coding lands in an, in an hospitable environment, which basically means a planet with water, it will generate forms of life similar to the ones that are on this planet. So that means that all life in the cosmos is related and comes from the same source. Mm -hmm. And that's really uh, just a nuts and bolts 
version of how Plato talked about the origins of the cosmos. So it's not that there's a puppet master creating different kinds of being. It's that we have a cosmos full of beings. It's part of the nature of the cosmos. And some civilizations are older than others. And some have better tech than others. And some are more uh, spiritually and emotionally rounded than others, which I think is us, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we are so interesting to some of our neighbors. And so um, we, you know, we're all cousins ultimately. So it's simply older civilizations that are turning up, but we all come from the same source. We all come from the yeah. same um, genetic coding which is part of the properties of the cosmos just as much as the properties of light and the law of gravity. Mm -hmm. You know, I've um, often heard, you know, in over the last decade or so that um, we put our own personality traits on, on our gods, right? Like um, a vengeful God and different types of personality traits that we have on earth. And from what you've explained today, it's almost like um, that these beings came down and they had these personality traits and we kind of adopted it, that they were our, in essence, they were our fathers and mothers, right? They were the ones that seeded yes. us and created us. So instead of looking at it as in there's this God and we're portraying these beliefs on it, we can even see it as that these beings came down to earth. We thought of them as gods and then we started basically acting out the same way that they were, you know, imposing yes. themselves on us. That's exactly right. And in the Sumerian version of that story, there's a very interesting detail to it, because in the Sumerian story, it's not just that advanced cousins came and dominated the population that was already here. They came and they genetically modified the population that was already here so that right. we would be more governable. And it wasn't just any old uh, Anunnaki DNA that they used to splice with ours. The, store, the Sumerian story says they took the DNA from a being called Kingu, and they used that genetic information to combine with what we would call primate DNA to produce a species who could, could be easily conquered and governed. The reason they picked Kingu is that he was an Anunnaki but he had been defeated by the ones who were running the show. Perfect. Huh. Perfect. Because wow. he's got some of the advantages we want the humans to have, be a bit more intelligent, but this was one who could be dominated by the others, so we'll breed from him. And so that's how the Sumerians tell the story of an upgrade just up to the desired level where we can all be managed. Wow. Wow. It's a very specific way of telling a story that does repeat in cultures around the world. Yeah. It talks about the fine tuning of our level of intelligence and consciousness through a process of what we now call genetic manipulation. Mm. That's so interesting. So it had um, basically a conquered mentality, a sentient yes. intellectual individual that had already been conquered. That was the perfect blueprint for what they needed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you spoke earlier about the senior Elohim, and you know that makes me think: who are the junior Elohim? You know, so could you speak a little bit more of what the senior Elohim is? And is there a hierarchy within the Elohim? Yes. So there's hierarchy expressed in a, a number of uh, ancestral narratives. It's there in the Mesoamerican story that's in the Popol Vuh, the Mayan story where the genetic engineer is subject to a council. And so he's having to make decisions that the, mm. sorry, affect decisions that the council have made. We have something similar in Genesis 3 where the, or if I go to the Sumerian, we get to Enlil, who is the commander of this region of space. And his younger brother is the commander of Project Earth. And so, the one who's doing the genetic manipulation is junior to another. And the, the senior, Enlil, has less contact with humans, doesn't like them, and is willing to make far more cold-blooded, cutthroat decisions because of that. And so we understand that conflict in, in those terms. That reflects in the Bible, where you've got um, 
the Yahweh character and the serpent character playing out that same story. And you might think, oh, so Yahweh is Enlil and the serpent is Enki. Well, it's not quite that simple because the name Yahweh has been superimposed over lots of stories in the Bible that were originally Elohim stories. And when you get further into the Bible, you discover Yahweh isn't Enlil. Yahweh is not the most senior. Yahweh is on the council, presided over by another entity called El Elyon. And it's El Elyon who parcels out human colonies to different powerful ones, and Yahweh gets the tribes of Israel. And so in that moment, I can't remember the, the text where that happens, um, the reference for it. In that moment, you realize Yahweh is one of the juniors, and that El Elyon is actually running Project Earth at that point. So it's one of those moments that clues you that, just because you see the name Yahweh in the text doesn't mean it's always the same entity that's being described. And a lot of the time, he is one of the competing Elohim. Uh, and you have to understand that to realize why he's so uh, embarrassed and com uh, competitive over and against neighboring Elohim, why he's got this insane rivalry going with the powerful one of Ekron. And he describes himself and the powerful one of Ekron using the same word. They're the same kind of being. There's a peer-to-peer -peer thing going on there. And they're all fighting for resources. Right. What makes it confusing is you get to the end of the Bible, and the name Yahweh is now being used for that vision of a transcendent God, a cosmic source. And it's been made deliberately confusing by those 6th century BCE redactors who wanted to make it look like all the Yahweh stories were God's stories, but they're not. They are a, a panorama of stories within themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, that right there also connects to our political ideology, what you just stated in, re in regards to um, the further disconnected you are from the population, the more corrupt these individuals seem to be, you know? So just talk about it as the, as the federal government and those that don't, aren't connecting with the people and the localized communities and then you go further and further down to those that are actually interacting with the local communities and from the communities, but they're also the political figures. So, you know, that connects with the senior Elohim and all that. So I'm just seeing a lot of mirrors and everything that you're showing here, sharing here. All right. So we have a question from Connie Howard asking, how can the churches change their belief in what has been taught for so long? I try to say aliens in the Bible really means ETs. And of course, they did not believe my interpretation. Yes, well, that's a great question. I am in communication with a number of senior church figures who are asking that same question because they understand that the what Christians call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, are stories of other kinds of being. Now, this was talked about openly in the first couple of centuries of Christianity and then it became a taboo because it didn't become the mainstream view. And then the mainstream view was turned into orthodoxy, militarized by the empire. Hence, you try and have a conversation today on this topic and it will be met with horror um, and you might be invited to leave. But uh, I'm a little bit hopeful that... Um, we might be nearing a time when church leaders are more willing to leave more questions unresolved over the Old Testament stories. Because if you believe that God is anything like Jesus suggests, then you can't read the Old Testament stories at face value unless you're going for a very dare I say, unintelligent, unintellectual kind of Christianity. Um, anyone who is a follower of Jesus would already have serious questions about the morality of the Elohim and Yahweh stories. And I think we're nearing a point where pastors can begin to uh, affirm people's questions. And we may be reaching a tipping point where enough senior figures in the world of the church 
are willing to do that publicly, that it gives permission to other pastors to do the same. Now, we've seen the um, the um, beginnings of this, I think, in the Roman Catholic Church, where we've had uh, the Reverend Dr. Guy Consolmagno, senior astronomer for the Vatican, and Monsignor Corrado Balducci, the senior advisor in the paranormal for the Vatican, and Father Jose Gabriel Funes, the director of the Vatican Observatory, all saying that there are ETs in the Bible and that we should go back and reread Old Testament and New Testament and look out for where these other kinds of entity appear. And if we are willing to do that, then the, the stories do begin to open up. Now, if they can say that, and they said that under the most conservative pope in my lifetime, then other senior church leaders can do the same. And I think that there are church leaders around the world, particularly those with a strong academic background, and those who uh, have ministries that brave the paranormal, those two groups have people within them who know everything I've just said. Mm. And we're going to reach the point soon where there are enough such people raising these questions publicly enough that it gives enough mainstream pastors the permission to say, actually, I've always wondered, and right. then things can begin to change. And I don't think that time is too far off. Mm -hmm. Me too. You know, and as you're speaking again, more dots being connected. It's, it's almost like, so 600 BCE, we have this um, monothe monotheization of, you know, the ancient world. And then it's, it's like Jesus came down almost to bring forward this awareness again and to remind everybody, you know, of what we're, you know, what they were leaving and going from. But um, this connects to, you know, one of our presenters here, Margaret Riglioso, she was on the Greek conference, but she does this whole presentation on, um, what is it, the virgin births, right? And how there was an ancient priestess school um, that for thousands of years used to do certain rituals and ceremonies to create a portal in the womb to pull in souls from the Pleiades and give a virgin birth. And Pythagoras has this story, and so does Jesus. So if you look at the actual the ancient mystery schools of the, the Immaculate Conception School with, during Jesus' time, that also connects to bringing in a soul from the Pleiades. So it's almost like they were bringing this avatar in to remind people of the true connection to whatever is out there. Right? Yes, that's right. And uh, to bring in a, a soul from a helping civilization. Right. And uh, Pythagoras, helper, absolutely. Jesus, helper, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, stories of those kind of uh, anomalous pregnancies, um, they are worldwide. You can find them in, in China as well. It's the story of Lao Tzu's mother. It's the story of the mother of the Yellow Emperor. And Lao Tzu, again, helper of humanity, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you can even track that those the the teachings were hijacked, right? Like Jesus's teachings were hijacked, um, and so was Pythagoras. He was, um, you know, anti elitism. Um, everything that his information was utilized for, um, basically, he was actually against, right? Yes, that's right. Yes, you can see that pattern many times over, where the uh, elite begins by uh, affirming the teaching and then yeah. sort of spinning it right you can certainly see that with jesus you know by the time you're in the what was it the uh, the 500s ad you're beginning to get um portrayals of jesus where he clearly is part of the machinery of the empire you know he looks italian he's wearing roman military uniform so he's under the emperor by this point <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can see this gradual morphing happening. You can go to England and find um, decorations that survived the um, revolution when religious art was all whitewashed over. Some of that old art shows through. And you've got images of Jesus, Mary, and the local squire. And so you can see how the elites are trying to hijack the whole narrative so that this becomes part of a story of their right to rule. 
their governance. I mean, you'll hear the language of this. I don't want to be, a, you know, a, a party pooper, but you'll hear all the language of this when we get to King Charles's coronation, of course. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, you know, there was another thing that you mentioned about um, how when the power goes, like, is when the power is handed down, a lot of times individuals think that things have shifted, but those behind the scenes kind of are still ruling it in many cases. And a great example is the corporate interests that are happening now are basically fueling both sides. You know, look at World War II, there was the same bankers fueling both sides as well. It was the same interests were really being pushed forward. And that reminded me of the, a lot of stories in ancient scriptures and Greek scriptures and Egypt, Egyptian texts that the old gods were taken over by the new gods, right? And the old pantheon, but there was a new pantheon. So what's your take on that? Do you think that was a mirror story of like, because the, the, the people in power, basically by saying there's a whole new pantheon of gods, make it look like there's a new world with new possibilities, but it obviously seems like the control has actually gone down through the century since then. That's a really good insight, Neil. And to be honest, I hadn't really thought about that. I hadn't thought about the uh, the new pantheon in those terms. Uh, I think uh, you're probably right. I had uh, previously thought of it more in terms of assimilating uh, old story to new story in kind of in the way that happened when the missionaries went to England and they built the churches on the sites of of Druidic temples, that sort of thing. So you can just put a spin on the old patterns of um, tribute and adoration, so on and so forth. And I think there was a bit of that done, certainly in, in the Roman Empire, where there were established patterns of worship and protocols that needed to be given a new appearance, maybe even a Christian appearance, but there were actually still the old religion. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I saw that for myself in Brazil, for instance, when I was there in the 1980s, where you saw what looked like the new pantheon, to use that language, where you've got the figurine of Mary and the figurine of Jesus and the figurine of St. George But what you don't realize is that it's actually the old religion and the Mm -hmm. old rituals that are being used. And they've simply put new faces and new names on the entities. But it's really still the old entities and their stories that are being invoked. So I think perhaps with the, the, the Roman pantheon, that something of that was happening. And I do think there was a, um, an attempt to continue old knowledge and old patterns, particularly for the elites, Mm -hmm. while giving the appearance that everything had gone over to Christianity. Yes, and that's what I was going to ask you next. Do you think the Vatican Church is that in some ways? (laughs) Well, it's full full of symbology that would suggest that. I'll just leave it at that. Right. I mean, and they did take a lot of um, structures from Egypt and, you know, put it in their basement or whatever. But uh, they actually took a lot of things from the um, the pagan world, if you will, and yes. put it in places of high importance in the world. Ley lines. Yes, they did. Mm-hmm. Yes, they did. And there would be um, um, esoteric groups, secret societies that would understand all that symbology and that would look at objects that are out there in in St. Peter's Square, for instance, and say, I know what that is. I know what that means. But the great mass of the public don't. Yeah. Okay, so we have a question here from Jennifer. Um, All right, here we go. Uh, I've heard this question a few times, so I'm curious your take on it. Are people who have RH negative blood type descendants of giants talked about in Genesis called the Nephilim? So any info on that? I get asked that a lot, and I don't have any information on it. Um, It's a really interesting question, the the fact that uh, humanity is two breeding groups. That's just very strange, and there has to be an explanation for that. And also cultural differences are really intriguing. Where do those 
come from? The spectrum of human appearance, where does that come from? I get asked these questions a lot, and I'm asked, is there anything in the ancestral narratives that speaks to those questions? And at this point, I just have to say there may be, but I haven't found it at this point in my research journey. So you'll have to ask me again in another 12 months. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a question here from Regina. The Egyptian sun gods predate Yahweh. Dendara intimates that they came from Sirius. This group successfully kept a tight rein on the population through their religious ritual for millennia. It does seem that the Egyptian gods and those of Sumeria were likely the same. In many ways, the Egyptians established the pattern for all other civilizations. Would you agree with that? Um, I think the, the the patterns were older than that. Uh, the serious connection and the serious connection with the Yahweh character is really intriguing because all the stories I hear of people like Asherah from the Pleiades are positive and nurturing. Um, Sirius, there are nurturing stories that we can hear from Mali, West Africa. Uh, but it is a different place. It's a different region of space. And I noticed when I was doing the research for Escaping from Eden that the uh, oldest book in the Bible, or what many scholars think is the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, identifies three regions of space exercising power dynamics over what happens on planet Earth. And one is the Pleiades, and one is Orion, and one is Sirius. Yeah. So what I've just heard makes some kind of sense, that the Yahweh character might be from somewhere quite different to the Pleiades, thank you very much. And if I were to hazard a guess as to where, it would be either Sirius or Orion. Although Orion, the stories are probably a little bit more ambiguous than Sirius and the Pleiades. Orion seems to be associated more with uh, control we can do absolutely nothing about. And Sirius, there's a bit of a blend of light and shade, and the Pleiades a bit more light in it. Um, so I would just, I would be really interested to pursue that uh, line of research, to be honest. I, I haven't plumbed those connections. Uh, so that's probably as much as I can say at this point. Yeah. That's so interesting. You know, just to add to that, based on just connecting with so many presenters over the years, um, I have heard many stories of, you know, you probably heard it too, the Orion Wars, right? And also the DNA wars that started in Orion. And, um, but then fast forward to a lot of information now that happened a millennia ago. And Orion, for the most part, is a very peaceful, um, uh, peaceful constellation. It's, you know, what a lot of people are saying, Orion star seeds that claim to be from there. And um, yes. but it's interesting because one other story I heard many times from different channelers, independent of each other, and some researchers, were that there were beings that were in Orion to escape persecution, in, um, basically disintegrated from that experience and incarnated into Earth, thinking that they will remain and uh, um, will keep their memories, not realizing Earth was a place of amnesia. And then a lot of them came down to Earth with the imprint of what they did in Orion. And without even knowing about it, became a part of the elitist issue on Earth right now, instituting the same patterns. So I'm just throwing that out there because it's got similar, um, yes. similar storyline to what you're sharing. Well, that's interesting because I have heard that said about um, the Pleiades as well. Bearing in mind the Pleiades is a star system, so it's not right. a single population we're talking about. Exactly. We're talking probably about a spectrum of beings, some very flesh and blood like us, and some that might be quite different interdimensional kind of entities. And there are stories told about Pleiadian civilizations that have um, transcended war, meaning they've gone through a time of conflict. They've done that. and They've come out the other end to an understanding of how to do harmony. And that's part of their interest in us and their concern for us. And I, I just mention this because um, those who know this will be sorry if I don't say it, but that is represented in the original Star Trek canon as well, because that's the story of Vulcan, uh, a planet that's known terrible conflict, but they have found a way through it. They found a way of, of peace. Uh, 
and logic. And that's the Spock character who's now observing human behavior with a raised eyebrow, rather right. interested in the way we conduct ourselves. And I'm told that that was really Gene Roddenberry's code for the stories of the Pleiadians having gone through warfare and come out wow. the other side and are now observing us with that raised eyebrow and kind of um, bemused affection. And I I mentioned that because there's a lot of esoteric information that does find its way into the Star Trek canon, just like our ancestral narratives. It's not pure fiction. There is stuff in there that is storytelling from our ancestors and also channeled information as well. Exactly. So that gets my attention. These stories have resonance for a reason. Right. And the prime directive, the law of non-interference, you know, is also part of Star Trek. Yes, it was. And of course, we hear that spoken about in, in the Book of Enoch when it talks about this moment of hybridization that so many cultures remember. It's told as a story of a breach of a prime directive. Hmm. And often Christians read it in a religious language. They say, oh, well, this is fallen angels. This is angels who've left their station. They're no longer obedient to God. Well, Go back to the root meanings is my big thing in the Book of Enoch. And what you're actually being told is they have breached an agreement wow. by coming to the planet's surface and creating another wave of hybridization. Because that's already there's already been hybridization by the time that happens. Yeah. But this was not authorized. Clearly, by this point, there's some kind of a, a council, a sky council up and running, as the Bible calls it, or the Galactic Federation, as Hey Meshed calls it. And there is an agreement that's been breached. And so, yes, I think that is um, that's a real thing. I think the policy of silence and non-disclosure by our governments through the ages is something they didn't set. I think that was set at another level. And it's this prime directive of non-disclosure, non-intervention, although the history of humanity suggests quite a bit of intervention right. and quite a bit of disclosure. Yeah. So it's almost like what kind of non-interaction? Maybe they can't just come down here and tell us something in plain sight, right? Or maybe it can be done more etherically or indirectly, and it can't just be so blatant. Like, you guys are destroying yourselves. We're landing on, the, um, on your field right now, letting you know that you did something wrong. We're real, right? So what level of non-interference is the question? Yes, yes, that's true. And it's interesting you mentioned that you guys are destroying yourselves message because uh, that does appear, uh, without going into too much detail, to have been part of conversations at the covert government level of contact. But uh -huh. it's also there in a lot of popular contact experiences as well. And um, yeah. I remember there was... Um, uh, a little girl who was one of the primary school students at Rua in Zimbabwe who had a communication experience with one of the beings uh, in that close encounter. And she said that was what was communicated to her. They're very concerned about how we're living on the planet, how we're destroying our own planet. And it's such a beautiful planet. And similar to that, in um, the Virginia incident in Brazil in 1996, there were three girls who had eyes on with a being uh, from a crashed craft. And when it communicated with one of the girls, there was this profound sense of sorrow, humanity. We don't know who we are. We don't know what our potential is. We don't know that we could live so much better and in far greater harmony with ourselves, with our planet. It's a theme that recurs at that grassroots level, as well as in um, leaked stories from the higher ups who have contact. Yeah. All right. So I have, if there's no more questions for anybody in the room. Please, if you do have any questions, let us know. But I have um, some, maybe one or two closing questions here. Um, and this time I want to talk about stone circles because, and how this connects to South Africa and Africa in general. Because you, you spoke about um, stone circle imagery or stone circles being left or just stones in general, I guess, being erected in places where paleo contact had happened with all these different beings. Um, 
that we also see a destruction of stone circles around the world. You know, we hear about Stonehenge wasn't really like that at all. It was actually fragmented everywhere. That's kind of a new creation. That's some story as well. And then through Africa, right, South Africa, we have thousands of stone circles, but all the way across the um, West Coast is a different type of stone circle. And then we hear stories of like from Michael Challenger and others that there was a um, an Anunnaki civilization, a colony in South Africa, and these were used as ancient um, gold mine operating digs or something along those lines. So just, you know, putting all that information out there, what do you have to say about, you know, stone structures in general and ones in Africa? What are your thoughts about all of that? Yeah, well, I think there are three things that we can observe if we're looking at ancient stone structures. Um, very close to where I live, there are stone structures that are huge boulders that have been arranged on top of one another in a structure that um, I would defy any natural process to create. Um, and if it's not natural, then it's pointing to technology that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. How were they lifted? Why, why were they done? They are the signature saying, we were here from somebody. I don't know who, and it's very possible that my um, Aboriginal Australian friends in the region have an answer to that, but uh, I've not been privy to that. So there's that kind of structure where you look and you think, what in the world and who in the world? There's a huge tower of giant boulders outside uh, Jos in Nigeria, which is probably the most famous and the most impossible. I think the conventional story is, oh, this is all done through erosion and there would have been other rocks and other stones around them originally and they all got washed away when they were under the sea. Well, you don't end up with a pillar the size of the one in Jos by that method. So there's that. We were here. And then there's the stones that we erect to say they were here. Mm -hmm. And so those standing stones don't have to present in any particular shape. They are just there, clearly placed, clearly not naturally occurring to mark those spots. And very often the local story will carry the memory of what all that is about. And so we have that in the Hebrew scriptures as well with Jacob setting up standing stones in Bethel where he encountered the beings coming and going from space. That's the Jacob's Ladder story. And then we have built stone structures. So Stonehenge, as you say, we now think was part of something much, much larger. So we, we've only got more questions about Stonehenge than ever we had before. And when we go to South Africa, it's not just South Africa, but it's a number of countries in the southern cone of Africa <clears throat> that are straddled by these stone circular structures that don't serve any purpose we can understand. They're not large enough or solid enough to be habitations. They don't have doorways to be pens for animals and the structure is just too big for it to be that. It serves a purpose we don't understand. Michael Tellinger and Jan Heimer have done some very interesting work around the sonic properties of those circles. And the sound energy they generate is um, anomalous mm -hmm. and raises the question of technology. Is this a technology that those who built it understood that we know nothing about. Was the sound technology used as a locomotion method, for instance? I mean, when I go back to the first set of stones where you pile them up, was it sound energy that moved those blocks rather than physical energy? Because there are no scars on the blocks. Why would you need a huge grid of locomotion, locomotion through Southern Africa using sound energy? Well, that's when you might make the connection with prehistoric gold mining in Southern Africa. Yeah. And this is the work of Michael Tellinger, well worth looking into if uh, this piques your interest, that 200,000 years ago, when our ancestors were on the planet looking very much like you and me, um, but apparently not ready, not bright enough 
to farm or build cities, yet bright enough to work in somebody's mine. Because obviously they didn't build the mines. Somebody built the mines. Somebody was mining gold. Our ancestors were there. There are hints of memory in the Bible and in other narratives of our ancestors being somebody else's workforce. You put all that together, and I think you've got a picture of colonization, gold mining, enslavement, and then a technology to move what's mined around Southern Africa and potentially off planet to somewhere else. Um, that's my guess. That's nothing I can prove. But on the basis of what's been found so far, I think that's where those stone structures fit in. They're, they are part of a technology, and that technology may be related to an industry of ancient gold mining. Right. Right, right. You know what? What it was or wasn't, right? We can we can speculate on. We can look at ancient texts, but one thing's for sure that you you spoke of, what is that? It's anomalous, right? These things are uh, vibrating in a gigahertz level that is not possible by anything natural on Earth at this point, right? That's Michael Tellinger's research. And yes, that's so, right. And it, if we went in with ears that could hear at different frequencies. The right. volume of that sound would be between having a vacuum cleaner in your room and having a 747 flying overhead. Mm -hmm. So it's very significant mm -hmm. uh, sound energy. Right, right. So um, beautiful, man. Paul, I've really enjoyed this presentation and this conversation. If I feel like every time we have a conversation, we really go deeper. Um, really just fuels my soul speaking to you, brother, and um, just going deep into these topics and exploring it because you're really piecing together our ancient past and bringing a perspective that is needed. And you're really doing the work to actually reach out to others to help inform people so that, you know, we don't have to just be a niche group of people, but even those that are in Christianity, you know, have the opportunity to really look at your material and do it in a way where they don't, they're not uh, ridiculed or thought as, you know, as wrong, but maybe just broadening the perspective on what they originally thought so that they can come to an awareness that is more beneficial for all of humanity, you know? So Definitely. I appreciate you. Well, um, thank you. And that's certainly my intention. Every one of my Eden books is intended as a gateway book yeah. that you could give it to someone uh, who's not read the others, and it'll be a way into these topics. Even if they're quite skeptical, there'll be enough in there to pull the reader through to the end and for the reader to think, oh, there's something actually credible for me to give some thought to. Yeah. And so there's a little bit of, overlap between each book because each time I have to be aware somebody might come to this never having read any of the others and I really want it to be like a funnel that can reach a very broad range of people people who wouldn't previously have considered these topics but who if it's approached in the story way in the way I do and if I'm sharing my journey in the way I do it makes it more palatable and easier for people to run down some of these rabbit holes and start exploring a different world i see it did you know what your fourth book would be when you started your first one uh i yes um yes i had it really at the back of my mind from escaping from eden that once you say there's paleo contact in the bible and it changes how you read the stories it raises the obvious question well, what was the Bible about? Right. Was it the book we think it is, but it's got paleo contact in it? Or was it actually something totally different to what we think it is? And yeah. so I knew at some point I'd have to circle back and, and take that question on. And that's what I do in the next in the Eden series. Mm -hmm. But in a way that you don't have to be that interested in religion or the Bible to read it. Uh, I mean, a lot of what I talked about was, was geopolitics. And a lot of what I talk about is human potential. So there are lots of different hooks that might pull a reader in and begin to see how these topics actually do join up with one another. Right, exactly. Yeah, when you started off and you're talking about Ghana, I was like, where is he going with this one? And um, this, it's genius. Like, you really took us from the ancient past, deciphered, um, you know, the ancient text, what it could really be. Now you've gone even deeper into showing that there was actually a time where even the monotheistic religion that we hold as the like the idolized monotheistic religion actually had multiple priesthoods, multiple deities, and all that stuff. And then you found a way to connect it 
to modern day politics and what's going on, on the planet and how that there are other templates that we could follow that doesn't have to be based on this uh, power structure that we're under right now. So genius, brother. So <laughs> thank you so no, much thank again you. for everything, man. And just, you want to let everybody know before we close out, you know, any cl closing words and where everybody can find out more about you. Well, you can find me on The Fifth Kind on YouTube. And my other channel is just called the Paul Wallace channel. We're setting up a new website for The Fifth Kind. So come and join us there. You can find my books, Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, Echoes of Eden, at Amazon, Kindle, and wherever books are sold. And my website, paulanthonywallace.com, Anthony with an H and Wallace, W-A-L-L-I-S, paulanthonywallace.com. If you want to do coaching with me, that's the place to go. Go to my website and we'll get into a conversation. Beautiful. Paul, I always appreciate our time together, brother. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. And it really is my pleasure and privilege to include you in the next book and give a shout out to what you're doing neil because i absolutely love portal to ascension thank you so much are you able to tell me what you wrote or do i have to wait till the book comes out <laughs> no you'll have to read it have to read the book <laughs> okay I'll do, I'll do it all right man thank you so much paul we'll talk all right. later all the best okay. bye take care brother take care everybody thank you so much for joining us um as always the replay will go out within a couple of days I appreciate every single one of you have a beautiful rest of your day, wherever you're on the planet. Speak later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind. Please check out our official website at fifthkind.tv. This video is in association with Portal to Ascension. Visit portaltoascension.org for access to thousands of interviews, conferences, and live events, including information on the upcoming three-day Portal to Ascension conference in San Diego, California, April 21st to the 23rd. 2023. Author and researcher Paul Wallace probes the world's ancient mythologies for clues about the origins of the human race and has published several books in the field of mysticism and spirituality. In the last decade, his work has probed the world's ancient mythologies for the insights they hold on our origins as a species and our potential as human beings. Paul's work in church ministry has included training pastors in the interpretation of biblical texts working as a troubleshooter for communities of faith, and serving as an archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia. Endorsed by George Norrie and Eric Von Daniken, Paul Wallace's latest book, Echoes of Eden, explores what secrets of human potential were buried with our ancestors' memories of ET contact. From Senate briefings in Washington, D.C., to secret ceremonies in Southern Africa, from strange phenomena in Australia and Iraq to mysterious encounters in modern Brazil and ancient Greece. Echoes of Eden will take you around the globe to discover why military, intelligence, and other government agencies are so interested in archaeology, indigenous rituals, and traditional initiation practices. What is the connection between higher cognitive powers like remote viewing and precognition and ET contact in the deep past? And what are the implications for us today? Echoes of Eden, out now. Available on Amazon. Follow the links in the description. Go to www.paulanthonywallace.com for information about Paul and his books.